Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our webinar is entitled A Personalized Approach to Managing Male Hormones. And our guest speaker is Dr. Pamela Smith. My name is Lenore Powell. I'm a medical education specialist in Genova's Atlanta branch. I am going to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Pamela Smith. Dr. Smith spent her first 20 years of practice as an emergency room physician with the Detroit Medical Center and then the next 20 years as an anti-aging functional medicine specialist. She is a diplomat of the board of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Physicians and is an internationally known speaker and author on the subject of metabolic, anti-aging, and personalized medicine. She also holds a master's in public health along with another master's degree in metabolic and nutritional medicine. She has been featured on CNN, PBS, and many other television networks, has been interviewed in numerous consumer magazines, and has hosted two of her own radio shows. She is a regular contributor for Fox News Radio. Dr. Smith was furthermore one of the featured physicians on the PBS series, The Embrace of Aging, as well as the online medical series, Awakening from Alzheimer's and Regain Your Brain. Dr. Smith is currently the director of the Center for Personalized Medicine and the founder of the Fellowship in Anti-Aging, Regenerative and Functional Medicine. Dr. Smith is the co-director of the master's program in metabolic and nutritional medicine at the Morsani College of Medicine, University of South Florida. In addition, she is the director of medical education for the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. She is the author of the best-selling book, HRT, The Answers, Vitamins, Hype, or Hope, Demystifying Weight Loss, What You Must Know About Vitamins, Minerals, Herbs, and More, What You Must Know About Women's Hormones, why you can't lose weight, and what you must know about memory loss and how you can stop it, what you must know about thyroid disorders, and what you must know about allergy relief, of which she is a co-author. She is currently working on her newest book, What You Must Know About Autoimmune Disease. The presentation slide deck will be available on our website within a few days of the webinar. You can access these resources, previous webinar recordings, brief video modules, and other materials by clicking the clinician's tab on the home page. So now I'm going to turn over the role of presenter to Dr. Smith. Thank you so much. I'm going to enlarge this so everybody can see it. So our objectives for this presentation are to describe the signs and symptoms of hormone deficiency in men. We talk about a, a lot about women, not as much about men. So we thought it would be fun to look at today. It's important to understand the functions of testosterone and really look at how we want to have this relationship because just testosterone by itself in men lowers cholesterol, blood sugar, and blood pressure. So we want to discuss some of these modalities. Those are our objectives today. And there are some references for you. And just so that everybody's familiar with the stereotogenic pathway, what I actually did to learn all of this stuff was I printed this out and I put it on my dashboard. And every time that I was stuck in traffic in Detroit, I learned a new part of the pathway. As you can see, the cellular locations of the enzymes that are powered by the mitochondria. And then you can also see the ones that are part of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So quite an intricate pathway for hormonal function. Andropause is defined as an absolute or relative insufficiency of testosterone or its metabolites in relation to the needs of that individual at that time in their life. So if you look at the levels of testosterone, 30 to 60 percent of men in their 70s are hypogonadal. At least in my personal practice, I find it's more than this. I think that we just haven't tested people, so we can't tell. From this reference, half of men that are healthy between the ages of 50 and 70 will have a testosterone level below the lowest level seen in healthy men 20 to 40. And I will tell you, this is my 41st year of practice, and I am seeing men younger and younger now have low testosterone. So it's actually changed over the years. So you can see the decline that can occur. The Massachusetts Male Aging Study showed a 30-year fall in total testosterone in men averaging 
a decline in free testosterone of 85%. And again, from the very conservative Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. There's seasonal variations, just be aware of that. Males' testosterone does change four to six times a day, but there are peak levels found in the summer and less so in the winter. So if you look at healthy male daily hormone production, we're gonna go ahead and click through all of these so that you can see the levels for each of the hormones. And it's important to understand this because as you can see on the slide, testosterone, men only make five to six milligrams a day. Baby dose. And so we find people overdosing quite commonly because they don't even realize what the typical dose a male makes in a day is. You can see on here DHEA is 15 milligrams. If you look at DHEAS, which is what you're actually getting on a saliva test, the bioavailable or active form, men make 50 milligrams a day. So they make more than women do to begin with, so the dosages for males tend to be higher on DHEA. And of course, then there's six studies from very conservative medical journals showing that the best way to measure cortisol is indeed to do a salivary test unless you're talking about Addison's or Cushing's disease. Testosterone replacement for men is safe. It's been studied for 70 years. So we know that pretty much what we're going to see as possible side effects. So what does testosterone do? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this section, but I wanna go through a little bit of it for you. It is obviously the sex hormone. The male has receptor sites all over his body, including his eyes. It's involved in the making of protein and muscle formation, helps manufacture bone, improves oxygen uptake throughout the body. It helps control blood sugar. It's needed for normal sperm development, and it does regulate acute HPA responses under dominance challenge. It also helps regulate cholesterol. It helps maintain a powerful immune system. It aids the mental concentration, improves memory, helps protect the brain against Alzheimer's disease, and it regulates the population of thromboexanthine A2 receptors on the megakaryocytes and platelets. And so therefore, it's involved in platelet aggregation. I think that's one we don't talk enough about. So what are some signs and symptoms of andropause, otherwise known as male menopause? Fatigue, tiredness, loss of energy, it's quite common. Depression, lower negative mood, irritability, anger, or bad temper. I was in a restaurant the other day, and oh my gosh, the person interfacing with me was so grumpy, and he was about 60, and I thought, buddy, I just wanna hand you my card. You honestly need some hormones. Anxiety and nervousness, loss of memory and concentration, loss of sexual drive and libido, loss of erections or problems during sex, decrease intensity of orgasms, and then of course, weight gain. Lots of other symptoms as well, backache, joint pains and muscle stiffness, loss of fitness. The patient feels overstressed. They may have a decrease in their job performance. They commonly do have a decline in physical abilities. They may lose bone. Cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure go up. Increase in heart disease, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. So the impact of testosterone, again, I'm not gonna spend forever on really what the functions are. So this is for your perusal later on. The point of this slide is you have effect all over the body. Low testosterone levels increase risk of heart disease. Great study from the European Heart Journal. So the trial showed men with coronary heart disease had lower testosterone levels, including free levels as well. Studies reveal low endogenous testosterone are related to an increase in mortality, not just cardiovascular disease. This study looked at men with coronary artery disease who were under the age of 45. 
total and free testosterone were lower than controls. So again, we are starting to see this at a younger age. Serum free testosterone levels were found to be inversely related to IMT and plaque scoring. This is from Diabetes Care. Low testosterone levels associated with arteriosclerosis in men from the Journal of Internal Medicine. So I deliberately today chose very conservative medical journals. In these studies, low testosterone associated with an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Since testosterone has been shown to lower blood sugar, the Endocrine Society in 2011 now recommends measurement of testosterone in all male patients with type 2 diabetes. And it actually surprises me the number of traditional doctors that do not do this, even endocrinologists. This study showed low testosterone predicts mortality from cardiovascular disease. Here, low testosterone levels associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality, independent of numerous risk factors, and serum testosterone levels were inversely related to mortality due to cardiovascular disease and even cancer because it compromises the immune system if the patient doesn't have adequate testosterone. Low endogenous testosterone associated with an increased risk of death from all causes and cardiovascular disease. In this study, low testosterone concentrations, higher rates of hypertension as well, and then of course an increase in cardiovascular disease. In males with heart failure, low serum androgens were associated with an adverse prognosis. This is from, again, the very conservative medical journal, Heart. In men with chronic heart failure, anabolic hormone depletion is common. A deficiency of each anabolic hormone is an independent marker of poor prognosis. In an animal trial, the authors suggest that the development of uh, memory loss in males is related to the loss of testosterone that occurs with aging. You notice this reference is from 1995. So some references I used were older because I want you to understand today that this is not new information. So some references will be from this year, some will be older. We've known this for a long time. Testosterone does play a major role in brain functioning. In this study, subclinical androgen deficiency increases the expression of beta amyloid plaquing and peptides. And this one, age-related decline in free testosterone, predicted age-related decline in visual and verbal memory. Low levels of bioavailable testosterone, a positive predictor of memory loss in men as they age. In this study done in Hong Kong, in men with low bioavailable testosterone, there was a strong correlation with memory loss, including Alzheimer's disease. Males that have a higher ratio of total testosterone to SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin, have a lower rate of development of Alzheimer's from the Journal of Neurology. Patients with Alzheimer's disease have been shown to have lower ratios of total testosterone to SHBG when compared with age match controls. And I can absolutely tell you that in my own personal practice. In fact, the last patient that I saw just before today giving the seminar, I was seeing the wife from memory loss. So we've been seeing her for two years. The husband always comes with her. He now is having cognitive decline. So I suggested that he make an appointment because when I was discussing things with both of them, not only did I have to repeat them to her, but I had to repeat them three times to him. And he's not on testosterone. Another study, prospective longitudinal study, the risk of Alzheimer's disease was decreased by 26% for every 10 unit increase in free testosterone. And they looked at it at two, five, and 10 years. Low levels of testosterone may occur prior to the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. 
low testosterone levels, but associated with mild memory loss as well, that's not Alzheimer's disease. And studies have shown a correlation between testosterone levels and cognitive abilities, like spatial performance and mathematical reasoning. Studies have shown to begin with, men tend to be more spatial than women are. And that's not a true statement for everybody, but it is pretty much been studied. It's very fascinating. This does change with the levels of testosterone going down. Studies done in animals have shown depletion of androgens results in increased pathologic conditions that are associated with Alzheimer's. So there's an increase in antibody levels, there's an increase in neurological death, and there's hypophosphorylation that occurs in animal studies, again, related to depletion of androgens. Another animal study, both testosterone and dihydrotestosterone have an effect on the upregulation of a hippocampal neurogenesis in rats. Higher levels of free concentrations, better performance of specific aspects of memory and cognitive function, and this is a human trial. They looked at men between the ages of 35 and 90, and even after adjustment for age, education, and cardiovascular morbidity, they still saw the same relationship of what happens when testosterone levels go down. This was not true of total testosterone. So this is one reason that we like to do salivary testing, is because it gives us the free hormone, the bioavailable amount. And men that have undergone hormonal treatments for prostate cancer, so they have suppression of endogenous testosterone synthesis, and they have a blockade of the androgen receptors. Studies have shown there's a beneficial effect on verbal memory, but an adverse effect on spatial performance when they block the endogenous testosterone synthesis. Another study on males receiving treatment for prostate cancer, the visuomotor slowing and slowing reaction times occur in several attentional domains. So in some patients, the plasma amyloid levels elevated as testosterone levels declined. In this study, when treatment for prostate cancer was discontinued, memory improved, but unfortunately, the visuospatial abilities did not. So first of all, we looked briefly at the physiology. Then we looked at what do the medical trials actually show if people don't have testosterone. So when people say to me, and I get this comment all the time, oh, there's not a lot of studies on men and hormones. Really? You've just seen today many studies. So now let's look at replacement of male hormones. So we want to look at pregnenolone DHEA. Men make all three estrogens, estrone, estradiol, and estriol. Estriol is still experimental, so we don't usually look at that yet. We look at dihydrotestosterone, testosterone. And of course, we want to do basic lab work as well. So we do want to look at complete blood count. It's actually malpractice not to do that, because if you're prescribing testosterone, if the hemoglobin and hematocrit go up, then you've either overdosed the patient, which I see quite commonly, and then what happens is if you overdose, the patient has to go donate a unit of blood. The patient could have a high hemoglobin and hematocrit on their own, but the most common reason we see it is too high of dose of testosterone. You do want to look at cortisol. It's part of the hormonal symphony. You always want to measure sex hormone binding globulin, PSA, albumin, progesterone, and then, of course, the rest of the system, meaning cholesterol, kidney and liver function, blood sugar, et cetera. And the patient does need a digital rectal exam every six months if they're on testosterone replacement. When you look at PSA, no matter where you're looking at it around the world, a PSA of less than four, but rising by 1.5 in one year, 
or 0.75 per year over two years needs further evaluation. A PSA greater than four, they need further evaluation. So I don't prescribe hormones if I see the situation. I have them see a urologist and have an ultrasound and a biopsy done of the prostate. If they're already on hormones, I have them hold them until we get further evaluation if they've had a doubling in the PSA, et cetera. So let's look at estrogens. Very important. Again, make, men make all three. Men need a small amount of estrogen to help maintain memory and maintain bone structure. Androgens do aromatize into estrogens via the enzyme aromatase. So if you give the male too much testosterone, it will make more estrogen. Too much estrogen in a male, it increases their risk of heart disease and prostate cancer. So what lowers aromatase? Chrysin is my personal favorite because I can give it by itself. It can be given PO or transdermally. It's much more common given transdermally. Or I can put it in the same syringe or pump as my testosterone if I'm giving the testosterone transdermally. Other things that lower aromatase, zinc, flaxseed, EGCG, and then of course the drug anastrozole. Chrysin does not have a side effects, so anastrozole can, so certainly easier to use chrysin. What increases aromatase? Inflammation, inflammation, and inflammation. Obesity, which causes inflammation. High insulin levels, the patient and vibing too much. Mold and other biotoxins and chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And where I practice in Michigan, and we also have a practice in Florida, we're surrounded by water. So mold is a big issue in states that are surrounded by water, but they're a big issue anyway. So if I'm working someone up for cognition, I always look at mold, I always look at Lyme. So there's a lot to look at here, but when we're looking at male hormones, remember mold and biotoxins can increase aromatase. Estradiol has a positive effect on memory. People are always surprised at this, but there's actually studies you can see there. And here, serum estradiol and testosterone levels have been shown to be lower in men with Alzheimer's compared to age match controls. So estrogen levels in males, medications can lower estrogen levels in men and cause them to be too low. I put on here the most common medications worldwide that tend to make estrogen too low. Estriol replacement in men is experimental, but we do replace it in autoimmune encephalitis and MS. And so you can get an estriol level in males, and I do replace it in my patients with MS. I only have one patient with autoimmune encephalitis, and he did not have low estrogen levels. So estrogen levels in males may elevate as men age due to an increase in aromatase, which we've just seen, but also to an alteration of liver function, zinc deficiency, obesity, again, abuse of alcohol, ingestion of estrogen-containing foods or environmental estrogens, high doses of testosterone, meaning we gave the patient too much. Of course, there's other environmental estrogens like plastics. Foods can increase estrogen and medications. Elevated levels of estrogen in men can, is associated with gynecomastia, but not all men get that. They may just get decreased sex drive or erectile dysfunction. If men have high estrogen, it doubles their risk of stroke. It increases their risk of a heart attack, peripheral artery disease, and coronary arteriosclerosis in general. If men have high estrogen, it increases their risk of insulin resistance, rheumatoid arthritis, BPH, and prostate cancer. And again, this is from prostate 1996. So it amazes me the number of people that don't look further at hormones in males for hormonal balance. Studies showed that high estradiol in men increase risk of stroke. Increased risk in acute MI. High estrogen 
low testosterone associated with promoting the development of the atherogenic lipid milieu in men with coronary artery disease. Low testosterone, high estradiol, increase in lower extremity peripheral artery disease in men. So it doesn't matter which estrogen. If estradiol or estrone is elevated, increased risk in heart disease. Men with myocardial infarction increase in high estradiol, and they tended to have lower testosterone. Here, elevated levels of estradiol associated with an increased risk of stroke, peripheral vascular disease, carotid artery stenosis, compared to subjects with lower estradiol levels. Same thing in this study. I wanted to put several references here so that you understand hey, there's not just one trial that shows this. There are numerous. Ways to lower estrogen in men. We talked about chrysin. You, if you've overdosed the patient, then decrease the dose of testosterone. We talked about zinc and anastrozole, but I did not mention herbal therapies. Grapeseed extract, wild nettle root, decreasing the intake of estrogen-containing foods, and eating foods that decrease estrogen. Other ways to lower estrogen in males, maca, decreasing alcohol intake, weight loss, higher dose vitamin C, which also increases testosterone production. The patient's low in vitamin K or niacin, supplementing with those nutrients can be very beneficial. Anybody who would like a list of foods that increases or decreases estrogen levels then please contact Genova. I will send them a list of those foods in a format that you can print out for your patients as a handout, and I do that. I give it right to my patients as a handout, and I'll send that over to Genova and just contact your representative or email us, and we're happy to get that over to you. Now, DHT. This is the most potent naturally occurring androgen. It's three times more potent than testosterone. It's synthesized from the conversion of testosterone through 5-alpha reductase. It's responsible for the formation of male sex-specific characteristics and the development of male genitalia and prostate. And elevated levels occur in hirsutism, male pattern baldness, and BPH. DHT has growth-promoting effect on prostate cells that's greater than testosterone. So early on, some people were giving testosterone and dihydrotestosterone to the patient. We no longer suggest that. High levels of DHT stimulate androgen receptors to make greater amounts of PSA, and there's an interaction with extracellular tissues for elevation of prostate cancer cell mobility, and so for that reason, we don't replace DHT. High DHT enhances early arteriosclerosis as well, and again, from the very conservative journal Endocrinology. Is progesterone important in men? It is. It is very important for the neurological aspects, and it can be used transdermally. It's a very effective way to also lower dihydrotestosterone. So we can use it for two purposes. I love this way of lowering DHT because it really doesn't have a side effect. And you can put the chrysin and progesterone and testosterone all in one syringe or pump. So are there actual studies showing that testosterone replacement is a good thing? Oh, there's a myriad of them. So let's look at some of them. And we're gonna go through these kind of quickly because my point in presenting this group of slides is yes, there are many studies showing that testosterone is beneficial. So let's start with cognitive function. In this study, testosterone replacement improved cognitive function. Here, it prevented the production of beta amyloid precursor protein in men. Here, testosterone therapy in elderly male showed some reversal of cognitive dysfunction. Here, it helped with mild cognitive impairment. And because I do see a lot of people for memory loss, I will tell you 
it absolutely works to help with memory. Animal studies have shown testosterone replacement can improve memory by reducing beta amyloid production. Older hypogonadomel, it improved spatial uh, cognitive function and verbal fluidity. In older men with dementia, testosterone replacement reduced working memory errors. So even if the patient already has cognitive decline, it is beneficial. In this trial, testosterone improved verbal and spatial memory and uh, constructional abilities in non hypogonadomels with mild memory loss and early Alzheimer's. Quote, short-term administration of testosterone induces a beneficial effect on exercise-induced myocardial ischemia in men with coronary artery disease. This effect may be related to a direct coronary relaxing effect. Wow, isn't that really cool? I mean, how many things have we found that actually has a direct coronary relaxing effect? Testosterone is certainly one of those, and from the journal Circulation. This study revealed the testosterone replacement associated with a decrease in HDLC and lipoprotein A. The mechanism of testosterone replacement decreasing lipids may be due to its positive effect on abdominal fat and on insulin resistance. Short-term administration of testosterone in this study induced a beneficial effect on exercise-induced myocardial ischemia and men who already had coronary artery disease, and again, direct relaxing effect on the arteries. Short-term intracoronary administration had positive effects as well. You actually get coronary artery dilatation. Low-dose supplementation, you notice the word low-dose. With testosterone in men with chronic stable angina, reduced exercise induced myocardial ischemia. Testosterone replacement increased coronary blood flow in patients with coronary heart disease. From the journal Heart, from the journal American Journal of Medicine. Looking further at testosterone and heart disease, transdermal testosterone replacement has been shown to improve chronic stable angina by increasing the angina-free exercise tolerance versus controls that were getting placebos. This is one of the reasons that I prefer to give my testosterone transdermally versus IM. Another study, testosterone replacement reduced exercise-induced myocardial ischemia. Here, again, a vasodilator and a calcium antagonistic agent. Looking further at testosterone and coronary artery disease, testosterone replacement in hypogonadal male moderates metabolic components associated with cardiovascular disease, decreases inflammation, lowers total cholesterol. In patients with congestive heart failure, it improved exercise capacity, improved insulin resistance, and improved muscle performance. Quote, there is no clinical evidence that the risk of either prostate cancer or BPH increases with transdermal testosterone replacement. And this is from Mayo Clinic Proceedings. It's reason number two of three that I tend to give my testosterone transdermally. It's not wrong to give it IM. It's just it more beneficial to give it on the skin. And I have it applied. They usually apply it to the inner thigh or top of foot because there is less hair there. And I always make sure that they rub it in for two minutes. Interesting men that are older with the highest risk of prostate cancer have the lowest levels of testosterone. So in these different studies on testosterone and insulin resistance, you can see there's a very beneficial effect. It decreases insulin resistance. It helps with hyperinsulinemia. In fact, supraphysiological doses of testosterone increases insulin resistance. That's the reason why you want to use low dose. A small amount of testosterone replacement 
has a favorable effect on insulin resistance. If you give too much, it actually drives up insulin and causes insulin resistance. So how do you give testosterone? Again, I'd like to have a compounded. I'd like to give it transdermally. This is reason number three. When you give testosterone transdermally, it helps with erectile dysfunction 81% of the time. If you give it orally, which I never see done, it helps 51% of the time. IM, it only helps 53% of the time. There's a big difference between IM 53% of the time and 81% effective for ED when it's given transdermally. So there are certainly transdermal patches. They can cause dermatitis, headache, depression, and skin irritation. So I don't tend to use patches. Gel formulations are applied in the morning. And ones that are made by pharmaceutical companies, they say to apply to the shoulders, abdomen, or upper arm. Um, this is usually a 50 milligram testosterone, so a pretty big dose. I never give a male more than 50. So my doses of transdermal are 5 to 50 milligrams. But in these studies, the higher doses were related to more of the acne, headaches, hot flashes, polycythemia, increase in PSA, gynecomastia, nervousness, insomnia, hypertension, et cetera. And again, you can get local irritation. Nobody really gives it orally, but I put this here. A buccal uh, system, when you give it buccally, it is oral. So this is probably not our treatment of choice. There are testosterone esters that can be given IM. Again, this is not wrong, but it's twice a week, and we tend to get highs and lows. The first day, the patient tends to be overdosed. The middle day or two, they tend to be fine. And then the last day, they tend to actually be too low. And so one reason that is IM is not my personal favorite way of giving hormones. And there's the rest of the esters. Some have longer half-lives than others. The echidinate can have side effects. So again, injection site reactions. And again, IM is associated with the higher risk of hemoglobin and hematocrit and RBC count going up. So you can compound a sterile injection if you want a different dose. Um, this is certainly something you can do. For fertility, we don't give younger men. I certainly like at 42 is my draw line. In younger males, I don't give testosterone. To preserve fertility, I give an astrozole. Uh, I'm sorry, I give HCG or Clomid, uh, but you can put them all in the same syringe if you want to. There are some suggestions in the medical literature that you can use HCG with testosterone. If you're going to give an injection, do not have the patient use it sub-Q. I see this done all the time. It is an IM injection, okay? And remember, the patient can get an abscess, so make sure they give it appropriately to their cells and they don't rush through this process. So this is a slide from uh, expert opinion in pharmacotherapy. And what it does is, and I love this slide because it gives you different options of testosterone. Okay, it doesn't really give you compounded, but it gives you a suggestion of a gel. It gives you the dosages. It gives you the advantages and disadvantages. Now, if you have a compounded, you don't tend to get the skin irritation because I put my hormones that are compounded in one of two bases, either Versa base, that's V-E-R-S-A base, and that is made for hormones for men or women, or there is a new base out, and that base is very good because it literally, it's called a trevis, a-T-R-E-V-I-S, and a trevis is literally made for testosterone only, meaning you could put chrysin and other things in it, but it's specifically new and designed for better absorption of the hormone testosterone. And more and more, I am using a trevis base for my testosterone, particularly in male patients. 
So here's the testosterone topical solution. Don't tend to use this a lot because it can be flammable until dry. So there's your dosing of compounded testosterone as a cream or a gel. And again, you can put progesterone and you can put chrysin and testosterone in the same uh, cream or gel. There are contraindications to testosterone use you should be aware of. If the patient has active prostate cancer, they should not have testosterone. The question is, what do you do after that? In younger men, if they have prostate cancer, it tends to be aggressive. So if they get it at 50, the current thinking is don't ever give testosterone replacement. In older men, let's say a male who's 80 develops prostate cancer. For Morgan Fowler's work at Harvard, the current thinking is if he has no reoccurrence after a couple of years, you may want to consider testosterone replacement. That's still up for discussion, but you can pull up Morgan Fowler's work from Harvard. But again, that would be older males because of prostate cancer and older men tends to be less aggressive. Breast cancer is a counterindication to testosterone use. Prolactinoma, prostate nodules or indurations that are unexplained, unexplained PSA increase, severe BPH until you deal with that, and severe untreated sleep apnea. So if my patient comes in, he's grossly obese, he could have sleep apnea, I have an evaluation for sleep apnea before I consider testosterone replacement. And that's because the hemoglobin and hematocrit tend to go up with the sleep apnea, and the patient can end up with an increase in RBC count as well. In younger males, we tend, again, to use Clomid or HCG to try and maintain fertility. So stimulating endogenous production of testosterone, you can do that in younger males. So besides using an actual medication, and this slide was put together by Dr. Sahar Swadan, who's a PharmD. I'd like to credit her for helping me with the slide. So natural therapies to increase testosterone and suppress estrogen, zinc, plays a role in testosterone synthesis. We talked about chrysin. Carnitine can be helpful. But we now know with carnitine that you should get TMAO blood levels before you give carnitine as a supplement. If people have a gene where they have elevated TMAO, then those people cannot take carnitine as a supplement. So that's newer information. And then cruciferous vegetables, quercetin, maria, uh, saw palmetto, and even antioxidants can be beneficial. In fact, antioxidants support testosterone production by decreasing oxidative damage to tissues synthesizing testosterone itself. So again, erythrocytosis is problematic. If the patient comes back with an elevated hemoglobin hematocrit, you can cut the dose. What I do is I stop it. I have them go donate a unit of blood, and then we repeat the H&H &H after 30 days, and then we reconsider putting them on testosterone. Not everybody would be that conservative. You all know me that are on today's webinar. So you know I will give you the most conservative answer. You could cut the dose. I don't recommend that. If the hematocrit is more than 54, then testosterone therapy really, according to a clinical trial, should be stopped. And then you can restart it again when it's at a safer level. So let's look at a case. 53-year-old male, and this is my own patient, saw his primary care doctor. Lab work and physical were totally normal. He wanted to know what to do about his chief complaint fatigue. Past history, unremarkable. Family history, father has Parkinson's. Mother died in a car accident at the age of 30. Social history, he works as a lawyer in a solo practice, but he works 80 hours a week. He's not on any medicines, review of systems was unremarkable, but he really did appear older than stated age. So what do you do? Obviously there's many things you can do to look at fatigue, but we're talking about hormones today. So we did do a salivary test of his testosterone, and we really want the male to have testosterone really at the upper limit of normal. There's a wide variance on serum or salivary testing. 
for what you consider normal testosterone, but we want the patient to be more towards dead center or the upper limit of normal, okay? Kind of dead center to maybe three-fourths of the way up. So you definitely want him in the yellow range or even toward the red. He's all, um, meaning the upper yellow and red. So all four saliva specimens here are low in testosterone. So we want to replace his. This is melatonin. I love melatonin being on the saliva test because it's a lot of information. People take melatonin indiscriminately because they don't need a prescription in many countries. And if you give the patient too much melatonin or they take it on their own, it lowers serotonin. So I love doing a salivary melatonin test. You do it in the morning between 3 and 5 p.m. and 3 a.m. with the lights off. This one looks at cortisol and DHEA. Actually, for the amount he's working, cortisol is not bad. But his DHEA is lower than it should be for his age. And that's because it's tugging on the cortisol. So stress reduction techniques and, again, replacing testosterone and replacing DHEA would be beneficial in this patient. So what I did with this patient is he was started on testosterone 10 milligram cream. His estrogens were normal, and we also started him on DHEA, 10 milligrams PO, extended release. In the second case, again, my patient, this is a 21-year-old male with a chief complaint of fatigue. Well, are we going to use testosterone? No. What else are we going to look at? He's tired. He's not anemic. So do we want to test him for Lyme, et cetera? Yes, but his primary care doctor already did all that before he came to see me for cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr. He also had complete thyroid studies, not just the TSH. It was all perfect. His fasting blood sugar was perfect. Past history, he had stress. His father died in a car accident recently. He's a college student at a major university, so being a college student can cause stress. He does have a family history of diabetes. So remember, stress drives up blood sugar. You want to do something. He's taken multivitamin, but he does work out seven days a week for 90 minutes. When you aggressively work out like that, what it does is it causes fatigue because it decreases all of the nutrients in the Krebs cycle. And the patient did appear very tired. So what do we do? Of course, we looked at cortisol. And you can see that his cortisol is low in the morning. We want a dead center of green. Not too bad the rest of the days. So he was already on a multivitamin. We wanted to do stress reduction techniques, and we did give him adaptogenic herbs, ashwagandha, ginseng, rhodiola. Now, with the DHEA, you can see it's low. You have two choices here. He's only 21. Could you give him DHEA? You could. It's certainly not wrong. I opted not to. I opted to go back and actually do an organic acid test to see what his mitochondrial function was. And he was deficient in most of the nutrients that fuel the mitochondria. So I refueled it because of his aggressive exercise. So I gave him magnesium at 400 milligrams of magnesium glycinate a day. I gave him coenzyme Q10, three to 400 milligrams. I gave him D-ribose at 15 grams. I gave him alpha lipoic acid at 300 milligrams, and then he did get carnitine 2,000 milligrams, but before I gave him carnitine, we checked to make sure his TMAO levels were normal. They were, and you could give NADH 10 milligrams BID as well. I opted not to do that because he was so young. It was something he really didn't need. And case number three, 56-year-old male, the chief complaint that he's had an acute, acute MI recently, his cardiologist wanted him to see me. Fortunately, Dr. Jim Roberts, who's one of the best cardiologists in the country that looks at it from a functional or personalized medicine approach, is only 60 miles from my office. So he sent me this patient. Patient really didn't get the connection. He just came because his cardiologist told him to. The acute MI was one month ago. The father had an acute MI and died of it at age of 44. The paternal grandfather died of a CVA at 67. This person's an auto worker. He's divorced, so he's had some stress. He came to me on a testosterone pellet and he was on a statin drug. 
he had fatigue, his memory was not as sharp. And so the cardiologist actually, when he saw him, because he was on a statin drug, he did give him coenzyme Q10 at 300 milligrams a day just before he came to see me. But let's look at his hormones since he's on a testosterone pellet. Wow, he was overdosed. This is not good. When you overdose testosterone, again, it drives up insulin. Plus, it has a very invigorating effect on the heart. So you don't want to do that, particularly this close post-acute MI. So we actually stopped anything he would do. You can't get a pellet out, okay? Uh, so we did go back and look at estrogen. We looked at DHT. We looked at progesterone. His estrogens were both high. His DHT was elevated. It's from his overdose of testosterone. So what did we do with this? Well, number one, his H and H was high. So we had him donate a unit of blood, which is really controversial a post MI, but I talked to his uh, cardiologist about this. So this one was a very, you know, a, a bad case where you don't want to overdose testosterone either. His overdose of testosterone, believe it or not, increased his melatonin because the body was trying to compensate. He wasn't on melatonin, but you can see on this test, all three specimens of his melatonin was high. His cortisol was not normal. Well, he just had an acute MI, he works too much, but it was also high because he was on too much testosterone. You can get too much of a good thing. His DHEA was not bad, it was dead center of normal. So in conclusion, are hormones important for men? Yes, I hope I've given you enough medical literature today to show you that testosterone replacement, if needed, is very beneficial. You don't want to just measure testosterone. You want to look at the whole hormonal symphony. I didn't measure, mention thyroid today or pregnenolone, except for briefly. You want to measure those too. You want to make sure you don't overdose the patient as well, because that's just as bad as not giving hormones. So do men go through menopause? They do. It's called andropause. And we want to do testing on them. We want to look at all their hormones and really go back and balance them for optimal health. Questions? Just for additional references, they're there for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That was a great presentation. And we did get quite a few clinical questions. So let's go ahead and start with this one. Could you please list again the two bases that you traditionally use for transdermal testosterone? Yes, actually all hormones are usually put in versa base, V-E-R-S-A base, B-A-S-E. But if you want better absorption for testosterone, there's a newer base that's made for testosterone only, and it's called Atrevis, A-T-R-E-V-I-S. And I will tell you, it's made all the difference in the world, particularly in my male patients that I'm using testosterone in. It really is very dynamic and increases the absorption extremely well. What are other ways, um, other than you mentioned regarding progesterone, to help lower an elevated DHT? Um, I, they're on the slide, so I'll have you go back and review that. I just highlighted the one that is the easiest to use. Okay. So can you review again why sleep apnea is contraindicated in terms of testosterone replacement? Well, it's untreated sleep apnea. Okay. okay, because hemoglobin and hematocrit go up. So you don't want to give testosterone to someone who has a high hemoglobin and hematocrit because they can clot. So if you treat the sleep apnea, the hemoglobin and hematocrit will go down. Then you can look at giving hormones. What would be natural ways to treat an increased testosterone? Well, treat the cause of the problem. Okay. Men don't have high testosterone on their own unless they exercise too much, so have them decrease exercise. You can take herbal therapies that can increase testosterone. I find some men do this to increase their exercise prowess, have them quit taking the herbal therapies. And then of course, too much pregnenolone, too much DHEA, and of course, giving too much testosterone. Again, treat the cause of the problem. 
And then we had a lot of interest in that document um, that you list that you mentioned that will list the estrogen containing foods and foods that can increase or decrease estrogen. So um, when you send that to us, we will make sure that we get it out to those who did ask that question. Um, we had some other questions here that did ask about males who have early dementia and there seems to be no other medical cause. Uh, would you recommend testosterone and other hormones as possible treatment? I always measure. And again, everybody here knows me. I'm really conservative. I don't give anything without measuring. So I'm going to do a salivary test. I'm going to do some blood work with the CBC, et cetera. And I really do do everything I put on that slide before I give anybody hormones. So I have them come in. We order those studies. They come back in about a month. We give them the results. If they're going to be on hormones, we recheck them in 90 days and every six months thereafter. Testosterone is a controlled substance in most states, as it is in Michigan, where I hold my medical license. So it does require you to see the patient every six months if you're giving them a controlled substance. And you would anyway, because you don't want to give, you want to recheck the H&H, &H, so every six months is key. For some clinicians, they feel that um, progesterone might be controversial for uh, males. What is your thought? What is your opinion about progesterone use in males? It's actually not. And I just ended up writing an article that I finished two weeks ago in Mark Houston's new book on personalized medicine. It's yet untitled. It comes out in November. And I wrote the chapter on hormones and the heart. So please purchase a copy because it will go through the actual medical literature on all these hormones for both men and women, including progesterone. So if you go on PubMed yourself, if you don't want to buy the book, then you know, go on PubMed. There's a number of things, particularly in the neurological literature, on um, progesterone for males. Awesome. The last question I have here is, what are the best natural ways to help increase free testosterone? Um, that's on that one slide that Dr. Swedan helped me put together. So you can do any of those herbal therapies or exercise will increase natural testosterone. Again, in younger males, we're not going to usually give testosterone. We can do Clomid or HCG. Uh, and that's beyond the scope of today's talk because we only have an hour. Uh, but we'd love to have you join us in Module 1 of the fellowship in anti-aging regenerative and functional medicine. Uh, we, that module is running in May in Orlando. It will run again in December in uh, Las Vegas. Or you can take it online. And then you'll have even further discussion of all of this, looking at not only this, but HCG, Clomid, et cetera. Well, in the interest of time, we will end our question and answer period there. So for additional education materials, we would like to encourage you to visit our website, www.gdx.net, and or contact client services. We also offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialists where they will help answer questions related to our testing, including choosing the right test and reviewing patient test results. We'd like to also encourage you to register for the upcoming webinars on www.gdx.net. Next month, we will have Dr. Stephen Goldman presenting on hormone testing, selecting the right profile for your complex patient, and several dynamic speakers to follow in the upcoming months, including Dr. Ann Shippey and Dr. Elizabeth Ward. Thank you again, Dr. Smith, for a great presentation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for helping to facilitate it, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Everybody have a great day and be safe.